In a captivating exchange with executive producer, writer, and Army veteran Daryl Fannin, we delved into the dynamic realm of storytelling, the quest for equality in the entertainment industry, and the boundless potential that technology unlocks for film and TV. It's time to dive in. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm glad we made it. We made it work. Yeah, me too. Me too. This is uh, this is exciting. I was looking a little bit into all the things that you work on and you've been up to, and I watched the trailer from Kino. And there's a line that stood out to me. I think, and I'll be paraphrasing over here, but it said, story is not only entertainment, but uh, a compass for each generation. Yes, yes. Did you write that? Uh, you know, I I didn't write that, and I um, I think that actually came from Stephen Tracy, who's our uh, fantastic creative director. But it was spawned from a conversation that we were having, um, kind of about mythical structure and how the most important things of humanity are passed along. Um, and it was just, I, I think, the way that he uh, captured it was perfect because you know, narratives grow and change, and myths grow and change and evolve, and it does kind of serve as this like. Um, you know, generational compass. I just, I thought it was brilliant. So um, I'm, I should have taken the credit actually, now that I'm saying it. <laughs> Isn't that no, what a great artist do? We just, yeah, we take credit for other people's work. I think that's how that works. <laughs> you know what? A lot of people would agree with you on that. But that just it stood out to me when I was listening. I'm like, oh, that's such a powerful thing because it, it makes sense. You know, it's the stories of, that really impact each generation and, and that will kind of help uh, us move forward and see what the future can look like based yeah. on those stories. So tell me more about Kino. I was looking into that. I thought it was super interesting, but people who are listening right now, uh, mm -hmm. give us a little uh, you know, spit about that. Yeah. So basically, uh, I had been working in the industry since uh, around 2016. I sold my first show. I was super excited and um, I quickly realized that there was quite a bit of inequity in this industry, um, hence the strikes that are currently happening. And I just felt like there were also a lot of inefficiencies. And I felt like, um, you know, this was a, an industry that was set up in the 1930s and um, it hasn't really evolved much since, like outside of slate financing, which is where we took the idea of going just from financing one film to making a series of films the economics haven't really changed. And while we've made much, much, much more profit, um, the, the pay, just like in the rest of the world, has not really grown with that. And so I was looking around at friends and individuals who had created billion dollar uh, franchises and values for these companies, and they were making a few hundred thousand dollars and struggling to survive. And um, I will never forget, while I was on my first show in Vancouver, um, there was another show that was shooting at the same time and one of the stunt actors died. And I recognized mm -hmm. like this person is out here working for a shitty day rate. Um, they are very much undercompensated. And even if this property goes on and makes billions of dollars, um, they're never seeing the upside, the financial upside of that. And that seemed pretty inequitable to me. And so I wanted to start a company um, that made movies. And the whole underlying goal was to give artists and everyone that works on the film uh, a piece of the back end. And so we, uh, you know, we use technology, we solve a bunch of inefficiencies, but the real passion for me was making a more equitable uh, kind of payment structure. Um, so yeah, we make movies and uh, hopefully we, uh, we do it in such a smart way that we can afford to let everyone participate in the upside. So how does that work? Tell me a little bit more of the process in terms of like, yeah. we're going to go ahead and develop a new movie with Kino what that would look like. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll take a, an example of a script that was brought to me by a, a, a Mexican-American director named Jonathan London, fantastic guy, and, and Noam Dromi. And uh, they had this idea. They wanted to make it. They had struggled to get it made because, um, you know, this industry suffers a lot when it comes to representation and seeing the value in the box office. Um, and so uh, they were struggling to get this film made, even though it had really great attachments. Uh, they were looking at a very small, like $2 million budget, and they just couldn't figure out how to do that. And so we took the script, we read it, we were like, oh, this is really interesting. 
And so we started looking at ways that we can make it more efficiently. So one of those things was bringing on really great brand partners. And I can't announce who those are yet, but we were just like, okay, let's find some brands that we can integrate into this film and help offset some of this budget. And then we started looking at the inefficiencies in marketing. And in the indie film space, especially, we have a real problem because um, we will spend 18 months developing and making a movie, but we do no marketing, no product market fit. And then we try and market it to the world after it's all wrapped in a very short amount of time, which as you know, if you're trying to like spread the word about anything in a short amount of time, it's much, much, much more expensive. And so yeah. we were like, okay, let's start at the very beginning. We can give you behind the scenes access. So you as a fan can come along as we're making this film and we can do all of these things to help bring uh, fans on board. And then when we go to the distributor, we can say, hey, look, we have 300,000 people that wanna see this thing in theaters. And it just gives us a little bit more control. Um, and so we started packaging this thing. We had some really incredible talent that came on board. And um, once we put it together, we realized like this is actually an inefficiency that we have in the industry as a whole. And this is like a billion dollars lost every year, or, or maybe it's yeah. gained by the corporations who are doing the advertising. But when you're a $2 million movie, you're never going to be able to compete with um, these $300 million blockbusters. And so by making yourself try and fit their model of advertising, um, which is, you know, usually spending two to six times the amount that it actually costs to make the movie just to make the world aware, you're never going to compete. But if we give fans access and we bring them along for the journey, then we can actually go out into the world. And so what we did is we created an app where fans can get on and they can just follow the creative process. They can do Q and A's with the cast mm. and crew, updates from set. So you're following along the journey. And then my whole goal was to create really fun experiences for people as well. Like what is gonna make you super excited to be a part of this community? And so we decided like, this movie is a road movie. What if we give away the car that the lead drives in the film to someone that's in our community? <laughs> Like, what if we, we just find ways of engaging fans and that they've never been like engaged with before so that we can bring them on the process, connect them directly with these filmmakers and kind of re-empower the artists. Um, and that was the thesis of uh, our app. Yeah. So we're talking about the combination of the production company, but as well an app community driven uh you know our lab for people to engage because at this point a lot of people perhaps haven't read the script yet so we're really starting that group or the the fan base from scratch yeah you know i think um it is kind of from scratch but also if you think about this every film that we have every every actor every director has a fan base for the most part and sometimes that's a very small fan base sometimes that's you know a hundred million people and so by like leaning into the fan bases of those artists, we know that we can reach a certain group of people and bring them along for the journey. So, and, and you know, there are people who do this in uh, the horror lane specifically or, or genre specific lane. So if you're, you know, a horror fan, you know, you can go to Bloody Disgusting and figure out, you know, whatever the next horror movie piece of IP is. Um, but for me, it was like, I wanted to re-empower artists because I think what we have done in the last few years is we've kind of taken away the power of the individual artist. And it's why you may not even know the name of the person who has created the most uh, profitable TV shows uh, of our generation. You know, like most people um, can't tell us who wrote Squid Game. They can't tell us, you know, like the Daniels are so amazing. Uh, and I've been such a fan for a long time. But mm -hmm. if they weren't just the Daniels, it's really hard to just like encapsulate that fan base. And so yeah. to me, it was like, why don't we find uh, every piece of IP, every idea has a fan base. There are 7 billion, almost 8 billion people on this planet. Art is, is, is a thing that if, it, if I respond to it, someone else on this earth will. And the problem for me in film and television isn't um, that these pieces of art are being created and they don't have a fan base. It's that we don't do a really good job of connecting those artists and their fans. And so when we created this, it was like, hey, how do we find a way to organically and naturally put these people together and create these opportunities? Um, when the web first started, uh, and this is a little kind of geeky and boring, so we don't, you know, but I won't go too deep into it. But when the web first started, it was like read and write. And it was just like, hey, here's some information. And then web two came along and we were like, oh, let's let's like, let's comment, let's subscribe. <laughs> um, but yeah. I think that we're re reaching a new level of engagement and, and people want to be involved in something. 
they want to uh, they want to be a part of something. And our culture in general is missing community. Um, when we look at the the campfires of ancient times where we shared our stories, today we go to the big screens. Now it's kind of this little screen right here. Um, we we lose a sense of community around art. And I think those stories um, are most impactful when it's a community experience. And so to let people be a part of that process was really important to me. You mentioned about we're losing the sense of community. You, do you think that's the case mostly because we're overwhelmed by you know, outputs, what's going on out there in terms of you know, social media, or even there's so much going on in screening, I mean, with yeah. streaming and the movie theater, is that more like you're referring to? Yeah, I do actually think that, you know, part of the problem is quantity. Uh, there's so much that's happening all the time. It's literally impossible to watch everything, um, which we didn't really talk about this, but I grew up in a kind of a, a weird religious thing when I wasn't allowed to watch movies as a kid. So I already felt like I was starting behind the curve when I came to LA mm -hmm. to try and break into film and television. And I was very grateful for streaming because it gave me an excuse to have not seen uh, everything, you know. But yeah. it is so hard to uh, capture the attention of the world now. Like if you think about the fact that we just binge something and I, I love binging film and television, you know, I'm, I'm as bad as the next person. But I do think that it's hard for something to live in the cultural zeitgeist for any period of time. And Squid Game is a great example of that. Like it came on the scene, everyone watched it. It was the pandemic. We had nothing better to do. We were greatly entertained, but then it kind of left the social narrative very, very quickly. And I think part of that is uh, marketing. Um, but when you just have such a large churn, it's, it's hard to create a community around a given thing. And that's why I think genres um, do a little better because it's like, oh, there's a lot of horror films and we can connect on that. Whereas if we're connecting around a single film, it's very difficult unless it's either an Oscar winning nominated film or a $300 yeah. million dollar blockbuster. Now, all the projects that are coming up to you, you're more interested to have distribution, distribute them via the theatrical or streaming is an option as well, or whatever outlet's the best fit for, for the product. Yeah, I really believe that no size fits all. Um, and I think that uh, part of the factory system that we have here is, is a, the problem. So I love, I love streaming in the right situations. Um, you know, I think you have to work really hard to make those uh, payouts equitable. Um, but streaming is a great option, especially if you're doing like uh, specific windows of releases. So I love theatrical. Obviously, it's the box office. There's nothing like going to the theater, um, but it's very difficult for uh, smaller films to make a successful theatrical run. And you have to be very strategic about how you do that. And what I love about our platform is that we give indie films the best chance, because if you know where your audience is, if there's 300,000 people that are engaging with this film and you know where they're at, you can help um, kind of shape your theatrical distribution so that maybe films that would never, they would always have to be like either straight to VOD or whatever back in the day. Now you can go, oh, we know the metrics. We know we can actually do a limited theatrical run here and we can get more eyeballs, um, which is, you know, the end goal for any artist. Yeah, the data must be fascinating. If you see that the fan, fan base is coming from the East Coast to the West Coast, you can really kind of program and where, you know, what would be the best shot to, to get a great distribution, uh, you know, point. Exactly. So and and also exciting. internationally, you can, you can help like establish and prove markets internationally. And this is something that, um, it's really kind of only available to massive tech companies uh, that can afford to aggregate all of this data. And so for me, it was just looking around at indie film and realizing this is a massive market. There are so many people who are creating and telling stories. And I, I really do believe that there's a massive audience for most of these films. They just don't know how to connect with the people who would want to see that. And I think that we are seeing um, a world in which technology is changing everything. Uh, and it's all so rapidly advancing that uh, those who don't have the resources to do this are kind of being left behind. And it's almost, you know, creating a further gap of inequality. And then a lot of indie filmmakers may have a great film that should be able to uh, recoup the entire budget plus and everybody make uh, a little bit more on the backside, but they don't do it because 
um, they don't have the data that shows how valuable it is. And then streaming services can say, mm, I know it cost you know, $3 million to make this film. I'm going to give you a million and you kind of just have to be happy. Um, mm. And there are a lot of people who are forced to take losses, even though um, their audience and fan base supports a much higher uh, return. Since the app has been developed and created and you've been able to kind of access some of the data, any specific thing has surprised you from, you know, from this experience? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think the thing that has been the most surprising is um, watching this conversation evolve so quickly. When I started this company, it was just a little over a year ago. Um, we were very, uh, very passionate and it was kind of considered this like edgy thing. Um, but since the writer's strike, especially um, the idea of creating more equitability for artists, it seems like as soon as we did this, um, you know, six months later, I think Matt Damon and Ben Affleck came out with their artist equity fund, which is like, hey, this isn't super equitable. We can afford to give everybody a piece of the back end. And I started seeing this narrative pop up and I was like, oh, this is good. We're kind of in the cultural zeitgeist. And now, especially with the writer's strike, it seems to be on the front of everyone's mind um, that the way that we're operating it is an industry. It's not sustainable and people deserve more. And then, you know, as we were pitching this idea around, I was shocked at how many individuals who were producing smaller films were like, hey, uh, will you just be interested in doing like marketing and merchandising for us? I see value here. We can, this is money that we were leaving on the sidelines. You know, we, we can actually see some power back. And I think it was accepted in a, a way that I really wasn't expecting. And I'm very excited by that because I think um, it's very it's very difficult for artists who are not necessarily business minded to always understand what's happening. And these these contracts are extremely complex. And so for someone to enter and say it's it's you, you just so feel so um uh, disempowered because you're, you don't know what to do. You're looking to your reps, you're looking to your agents and your managers and your lawyers, lawyers, but they're operating in a system that's been constructed to serve the studios, uh, not necessarily the individuals. And I think, um, I've been very surprised by the number of artists who wanted to help champion this idea. So correct me if I'm wrong, but by my understanding, in the industry for an indie movie to make money is extremely hard. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's difficult because it's hard to, you, you think about it, you're putting millions of dollars into a product um, and then you have to figure out how to monetize that. And at the end of the day, um, I am an artist, but I also understand that this is the entertainment industry and we often ignore that side. And so I think, Part of the reason is that a lot of times filmmakers aren't thinking about how they're going to recoup their money from the very beginning. They're just like, hey, I have this great idea. Uh, I think it would be amazing. And then they cast it and they shoot it and then they go, okay, we've spent $2 million. How do we get it back? <laughs> and that's tough. Like that's just a really tough place to be. Um, but it's also, it's difficult because um, especially in this world, when you look at the way that monetization works in streaming, you have to a lot of times have an international play. So if you limit your market to just whatever uh, your native language is, you know, if you're just Spanish speaking or just English or whatever, then you're limiting your market and it's hard, uh, at least it has been in the past to kind of get distribution for those films. This is also a world in which um, love it or hate it, it's kind of driven by star power. Um, and so it's a very weird industry where if I have a certain level of name attached, um, if I go attach a, a big action star, like let's say Matt Damon or Sylvester Stallone, uh, I can go pre-sell foreign markets almost automatically, which means I can go and say, hey, uh, I want to, um, I can find a, someone who will give me money even up front to have the right to put the, the film in their theaters. If you're dealing with the world of indie film and smaller budgets, it's much more difficult to get that uh, return because if they haven't heard of those stars, it's much more difficult to put them on screens. So the economics of indie film just really doesn't make sense. Um, that being said, there are certain things that you can do uh, to ensure success. And what I think is super fascinating about the indie film space is just like, 
from an economic standpoint is it's kind of a barbell. Like there's, uh, don't quote me exactly on this, but there's something like a thousand percent return on films that do really well. So when you're in the indie film space and you do really well, you, you 1000 X your investment. Um, but, uh, if you don't do really well, then it's almost a guaranteed loss. So it's like this barbell, either side of the, uh, the financial line. And I think the, there are things that you can do to de-risk these films. And there are things that you can do to uh, be a little bit smarter about how you package it and distribute it. And you can almost guarantee, um, or you can't guarantee uh, that you won't lose money, but you can, you can definitely hedge your bet, I think is the better way to say that. And it's by smart casting. It's by finding soft money, which is like tax incentives and those sorts of things. And I think that it's very difficult for artists, especially to sit down from the beginning and think about the financials. And as an artist, I would never do that. <laughs> um, but at some point in the process, I think it's very important for us to at least look at how we plan on uh, getting a return on our investment, because at the end of the day, we have to sustain a living here. And it's very difficult in this space, especially for um uh, people who are not working on $300 million blockbusters. Um, we're seeing the middle class squeezed out. Our deals are getting, um, our, our deals aren't getting that much better and the middle class is kind of being pushed out. And so, um, focusing on the financials has been very important. Um, so I think the, the, if you're trying to make your indie film and you want it to uh, have a better return, they're like figure out brand sponsorships, figure out ways of uh, thinking about your merchandising and marketing. Think about your distribution strategy before you're making this film. You can, you can write it in a vacuum. You can have a director's vision. You can, but as soon as you start making attachments, and I don't think um, that attachments should also uh, be driven. You, you shouldn't make your attachments based only on box office numbers, but it is very important to think about that because it's very difficult in this world to sustain a career. If you have four or five flops in a row, um, it's just, it's just hard to get that investor to come around and give you more money or to, to find that next gig. You mentioned about incentives as well, government incentives, but uh, there are countries in the world, most of the countries in Europe, South America, yeah. they have entire uh, group organizations, and even governments uh, yes. that will incentivize, motivate, and even finance a lot of most of the, of the production of a movie. Do you think this is something that we're clearly something that's lacking in the US because it's such a big industry? Would, would that is that a room for that to exist here or we're we'll way past that? I, I think there is room for that to exist here. Um, a lot of times, you know, and there are like New Mexico, Utah, there, there are states, Georgia, that have tax incentives. and But it's very difficult to compete because our incentives are much lower than those uh, overseas. So I, I definitely think there's room for that here. I, I keep hearing rumors that Gavin Newsom's going to try and do this for California specifically. Um, I, I was very interested. There was a section of the tax code called 181, um, which basically it, it became a write-off. So high net worth individuals could uh, literally pay for um, productions and it would be a write-off on their taxes. And so um, there are some of those things that exist. There are a bunch of loopholes. Um, so it's very difficult. It has to be passive income and all these weird qualifiers. So there's barriers to entry. But there are really interesting ways of doing that. And I think that if the U.S. is going to continue to be a hub of production, we're going to have to change some of our policies or at least readdress the way that we're doing this. The reason why, you know, Vancouver can have 40 productions going on at the exact same time is because you go north of the border. There's really great tax incentives, the power of the dollar. That's economically uh you know, if you're spending a million dollars or more, that's a really great return. Because if you're looking at 30% on whatever your your Canadian spend is, and there's a lot of great post-production houses there as well, you you can actually turn that million dollar budget into, you know, a 1.2, 1.3 million dollar budget because you have yeah. the power of the dollar, which, you know, is, is also about a 25% bump. Um, and that's significant in the world of independent film because the difference between a $2 million film and a $3 million film can be day and night. Um, just because it's, you know, 
it's uh it's limiting when when i did my first show it was a tier two new media show we were hundreds of thousands of dollars an episode so very low budget for a show about the end of the world and uh and there was we had to do two bottle episodes where they're like literally only four people can speak and i'm like how do you do a show about the end of the world where you can only have four talking characters um but it was just one of those things where $200,000 made all of the difference. So we were like, oh, absolutely. We have to go to Vancouver. We have to go to Canada. And they have such great crews up there. Um, I haven't personally shot in Mexico, but I know a lot of friends who have done that really great crews. Puerto Rico has a fantastic, I think up to 45% uh, tax incentive, which is wow. incredible. And, and um for independent filmmakers specifically, if you're not looking at uh, potentially shooting overseas, I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you're in the States. That's phenomenal because I think it's a matter of educating people as well, because I'm sure most people don't even know that was even a possibility. Yeah. You know, those incentives in all those different states and countries that you can go. I mean, I'm sure, you know, there's logistics and all the things that comes with that. Yeah. But as you mentioned, the benefit can be tremendous. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, it's a very difficult thing to educate yourself um, because you're so busy in this industry. You're so busy. It's so competitive. Uh, so you're so busy trying to just make something. If you're a writer, you're focused on trying to create a narrative that everyone wants and it's catchy and it's interesting and it says something and it also fits your values and your narrative and what you want to do. And so you spend, spend all of this energy creating a great uh, script and then you have to go educate yourself in how to uh, get an agent and then be a part of this working industry. And so then you you put all of your energy there and this is a lifelong learning process. And I'm just very fortunate that I was kind of thrown into the deep end early on in my career. And I had to figure out how to bring a budget down by millions of dollars. And then it forced me to think about the economics of this industry. Um, but most artists, I don't think have that, you know, that opportunity. No. So tell me the, the, the process of the app. Let's say I want to download the app because I want people to get familiar with that as well and how they can be involved. And once yes. I'm on the app, I can see the movies, the productions, what's going on, and I can engage, I can contribute, I can participate. But tell me that's, that's the premise, yes. right? Yeah. So um, basically, and Kino.studio is the, uh, the, the link. It's a uh, browser app right now, which means you can you know just pull it up on Google or Safari or whatever, uh, we're going to be releasing an iOS app uh, here in the next few days. We're dropping the beta uh, actually on Tuesday. So uh, this is exciting for me. Um, but yeah, when you when you get onto the app, you can create an account. We have you, you can free. So a free tier, which allows you to like see some of the behind the scenes content. You can literally um, you can buy collectibles from our movies. So you can buy props. If we had made Batman, you could buy Batman's helmet before the movie's made. Afterwards, we ship it to you. Um, you can get really cool activations like uh, updates from set, Q and A's, but you can also like win tickets to the red carpet. Um, like I said, the giveaways, we want to give away the car from our road movie. So we're finding really cool activations that's going to like just create epic experiences. Um, I think that what filmmaking was is you went to the theater, you sat there with the popcorn. It was like an experience and it was a communal experience. You would gasp together if it was a horror film, you would cry together. Um, um, even me, <laughs> if it was, you know, inside out, you're just like emotionally compelled. You would, you would laugh together if it's a comedy and we've lost some of that communal experience in the world of streaming. And so to me, it was like, how can we create community, people who love films and cinema, and then just do really cool things that get us excited. So private screenings, you know, all of those kinds of experiences. That's amazing. So before I go, I ask three questions to everybody. And I'm actually very excited to hear your answers on this one. Okay. Uh, I ask a recommendation for a book, mm -hmm. something to watch, okay, mm -hmm. a movie or a TV show, and who should be your next guest on the podcast? Oh, that's, that's great. Okay. Um, a book, I'm very torn here. Uh, Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces changed the way that I looked at the world. Um, if you are interested in mythic storytelling and just uh, the evolution, as we were talking about that kind of compass of generations, I think that book is absolutely phenomenal. And that is paired next to uh, Educated by Tara Westover, which is one of the best biographies I've 
ever read. Um, I grew up in kind of a weird fundamentalist religious section. Uh, she did as well. And I think watching her go from a person who was home, you know, homeschooled like I was, not allowed to uh, go out into the, the world and get a regular education uh, to, um, you know, going on to study and get her uh, doctorate. I think it's incredible, incredible story. Mental health issues are brought up. It's, it's fantastic. And it's all about challenging paradigms and the human struggle to understand and know more. Um, favorite movie, movie you should watch. If you haven't seen Everything Everywhere All at Once, um, I think that that is one of the most interesting and compelling films um, in a world of homogenized content where everything feels the same. This film stood out to me by far last year uh, as the thing that that made me excited by filmmaking and the idea that you can be successful and not um, just create a variation of the franchise that we've seen before. Um, yeah. Really, really thought it was creative. Anyone that's going to put rocks with googly eyes in a scene together. <laughs> it's a win. It's a win. Yeah. That's, that's a 824, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what I really love about that, that film too, is um, it was an expression like I hadn't seen it was genre bending. Like there's no world in which you have an action film with hot dog fingers. Uh, you know, like it's just such a unique uh, point of view and expression. And, you know, I love the Daniels from, you know, I watched turn down for what music video a billion times, one of my favorite music videos of all time. So I've just been such a fan of them and their expression is so unique. And I think it's what we should strive to as filmmakers is to present an authentic representation of ourselves. Um, and then who is the next guest that you should have? Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, that's a tough question. I think for me, uh, I, I want to say, I mean, I'm, I'm still thinking probably too filmically, but um, Keanu Reeves, I think is very interesting to me. Um, Keanu I, I wasn't allowed to go to the movies as a kid, so I really didn't start watching film and television until way late. But I watched The Matrix at 17 years old, and it melted my mind because I was watching the metaphor of my life kind of play out on screen. And I I was like, Keanu Reeves was the man to me. <laughs> he, he represented my own journey. I was living in this false reality. You know, um, I thought it was amazing. But when I saw how empathetic and generous he was as an artist... Um, and uh, as a human being, I, I think I gained a whole new level of respect for him. Um, and he, you know, we think of him as like this funny, you know, John Wick uh, kind of, you know, very specific type of character. But I think as an actor and as a human being, he's got uh, many layers to him that would be very interesting to be explored in this format. Oh, that's done. Let's get Ken Reeves in the phone. And make I love work. that. Let's make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll, I'll let him know that was he, you were the one who recommended it. Yeah, so, I appreciate yeah, that. So yeah, that would be the fantastic. The whole point he'd be here today is because Daryl said, we should call you up. Yeah, so here exactly. We are. <laughs> hey, I'm so happy we made it this work. Uh, I think when I first find out about you and you up to, I was so interested because it's it's bold, it's needed, and, and it's it's happening. And you are I'm, too kind. I'm thrilled. Yeah, I'm thrilled that we had the time to talk. I'm sure we could could go another hour with this, and I'm sure we're gonna have opportunity to do this again later on. It'd be great to catch up, you know, yeah. later later down the road and see where we at with the the app, the progress, and all the other developments you have going on. Absolutely, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. This was a wonderful conversation. Uh, likewise. All right, buddy. Take care. Thank you so much. Have a great day. All right. Thank you so much. Cheers.